Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, we will uh, now convene the uh, Ways and Means uh, Committee and uh, just point out that we're uh, operating under House Rule 10.01. So uh, I think a quorum is present. Is that uh, correct, Laura? That is correct. We have a quorum present. So we'll um, take a motion from Representative Olson to approve the minutes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the minute from May 8th, 2020. Mm -hmm. Any uh, discussion? Uh, seeing none then, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Members, you'll need to remember to unmute uh, when we're doing voice votes. Uh, it sounded as though everybody had. Um, our first uh, bill up today is uh, Representative uh, Wagenius's uh, bill. Um, Representative Wagenius, would you care to make a motion to put the bill before us? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would. I move House File 1842, the first engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us, and Representative Wagenius, you have some uh, amendments? I do. Uh, let me start with the DE amendment. Uh, I'd like to uh, move that, and uh, then we can take up the other two amendments. So I would move the DE4, and I'd like to explain it. Okay. Um, if you could explain the amendment, then Representative Wagenius. Okay, thank you. Members, this bill spends part of the renewable development account that was created as part of the agreement between Excel and the people of Minnesota when Minnesotans agreed to keep nuclear waste in Minnesota. The bill that arrived in this committee included the spending recommendations from the Energy and Climate Committee. But in the meantime, we reached an agreement with my counterpart in the Senate, Senator Osmick, and with the Commissioner of Commerce, Commissioner uh, Kelly, who represented uh, the administration. So what the DE4 is, is an incorporation of the agreement between the three parties. Okay, the, uh, mo questions. Go ahead. the motion is before us. Any discussion? I see none. Uh, did I hear a voice? I guess not. Um, all those, uh, any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Representative Wagenius, you have an additional amendment or two? I do. Thank you. Uh, I would move A23. Um, A23 refines the language in the agreement after we made the agreement. All of the refinements were agreed to by Senator Osmick and Commissioner Kelly. And as part of the agreement, we added a provision brought to us by Excel, which provides a fix to filing difficulties during the COVID uh, pandemic. And we can talk about that later. Mr. Evans from Excel is with us today. Uh, so I also have an A24 amendment that I would move. In drafting the A23 amendment, two words were dropped. A24 puts those two words back in. Okay, that um, motion is uh, before us. That would be an amendment to the amendment. That's uh, correct. Any discussion on the uh, amendment to the amendment? Seeing and then uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. Uh, Representative Wagenius, uh, if you want to explain the amendment as amended. Or well, this, the A23, I have explained this was a refinement uh, that was agreed to, plus the language from uh, that was proposed by Excel and agreed to. Okay, that was the X or the presentation then. Okay. Any uh, discussion on the amendment as amended? Seeing none then, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
Motion carried. Representative Wagenius. Yes, uh, to the bill as now amended, I will just uh, tell you a little bit about it. Uh, it does four things, actually, it appropriates uh, four things, uh, money for four things. It provides do dollars for uh, solar incentive program uh, run by Excel. Uh, this is an ongoing program. Uh, specifically on lines 1.22, it provides $10 million in 2021. And on line 1.23, it provides 10 million in 2022. The second thing the bill provides is $2 million in grants to communities that have lost or will lose electric, uh, an electric generating plant. The money can be used for research, planning, and implementation to address the social and economic impacts of the losing uh, an electric generating plant. The third thing is that the bill provides full funding, $46,400,000 uh, for the Prairie Island Net Zero Project that has a goal of developing an energy uh, system that brought results in net zero emissions. The final appropriation is for a new turbine to expand the electric generation capacity of Granite Falls, which has, a, there's an existing hydroelectric generating uh, facility there. And I should spend a few minutes uh, or a minute or so talking about uh, the bond proposal uh, that came from Excel. Uh, one of the bond requirements is that a lien is perfected within five business days after uh, the pricing of bonds. And normally these are recorded in person, but that's not working well with uh, COVID-19. So Excel would like uh, from now until December to fine with, uh, uh, file with the Secretary of State, and that is to perfect the liens, but it's also going to be filing uh, with the counties. Um, and with that, um, Mr. Chair, I would be glad to take questions. Can we have uh, Representative Scott? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, in reading the bill um, and, and seeing the appropriations, I, I had some concern that there was uh, there was no uh, funding back to the ratepayer. It's all spending, and I'm wondering what the thinking is behind that. If I could ask the bill author that question. Yes. Well, well, there are two things there. Um, first of all, we did not spend all the money. Uh, a substantial portion of it, over $55 million, is left on the bottom line. Uh, as we worked uh, with the uh, administration and Senator Osmick, we chose to fund the things that we could agree upon, and we set aside all the things that we disagreed upon. And then that's why there's 55 million plus left on the bottom line. Mr. Chair? No, I'm Scott. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, Chair Wiginius, was there any discussion, especially given uh, the COVID event that we're experiencing right now, was there any discussion um, given to ratepayer um, payments? Because a lot of people are going to be having difficulties potentially paying their bills. So I'm wondering if that was ever part of the discussion at all. Thank Representative Wagenius. As far as I know, no. Well, Mr. Chair, thank you. I, I'm disappointed to hear that, especially in these uh, what are going to be very challenging um, economic times. It seems like it would have been a great time to to uh, give something back to the ratepayers. They're the ones paying in and helping to fund this fund. So thank you for the thank you for allowing me to question. Okay, any further uh, discussion? Uh, seeing then, Representative Wagenius, would you care to renew your motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I renew my motion that House File 1842, the first engrossment as amended, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, any further discussion? Seeing none then, all those in favor signify, or we have to take a roll call on this because it's final passage. Uh, is the clerk ready, Laura? Mm -hmm. Parkman, okay, you can take the roll. Representative Carlson? Aye. 
Carlson, aye. Representative Olson. Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo. No. I'm sorry, could you repeat? No. Representative uh, Garofalo, negative. no. Negative. No, no, no. <laughs> Representative <laughs> Albright. Oh. Albright, no. Representative Bernardi. Representative Bernardi. Representative Davids. No. Davids, no. Representative Davney. Aye. Davney, aye. Representative Driskowski. No. Driskowski, no. Representative Eklund. Representative Eklund. Aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hamilton. No. Hamilton, no. Representative Hansen. Hansen, aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hausman. Aye. Hausman, aye. Representative Hertos. No. Hertos, no. Representative Hornstein. Aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Kresha. Kresha, no. Kresha, no. Representative Liebling. Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly. Representative Lilly. Representative Long. Aye. Long, aye. Representative Mariani. Representative Mariani. Representative Marquart. Aye. Marquart, aye. Representative Nelson. Aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor. Aye. Noor, aye. Representative Pulowski. Pulowski. Pulowski, aye. Pulowski, aye. Representative Poppy. Poppy, aye. Poppy, aye. Representative Schumacher. Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Representative Scott. No. Scott, no. Representative Torkelson. No. Torkelson, no. Representative Vogel. No. Vogel, no. Representative Wigenius. Yes. Wigenius, aye. Representative Bernardi. Representative Bernardi. Representative Lilly. Mr. Chair, I believe uh, Representative Bernardi and uh, Lily are having technical difficulties. Uh, they are responding via the video. Um, Representative Lily. Lily votes aye. Representative Bernardi. Representative Bernardi. Can we see her on the screen? Yes. Representative Bernardi. Mr. Chair, I think she can hear us now. If she could just indicate on the screen 
because we I can't hear her. You could just give a thumbs up or something. Repre mm -hmm. Representative Upward. Bernardi. I know she's had some technical problems before. I mean, this is all new technology. We just have to be patient. If um, Representative Bernardi looks like she's giving a thumbs up. Bernardi votes aye. Okay. If you can close the roll and give us the uh, count. Um, that's 17 ayes, 11 nays. Okay, motion not carried and uh, the bill is on its way to general orders. Thank, Thank you, you members. Uh, the next bill up uh, is uh, a bill uh, by uh, Representative Liebling. Representative Liebling, would you care to make a motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, so I move House File 4579, the first engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general register. And I also have an author's amendment. And Mr. Chair, if we could, I'd like to have that adopted so that we could discuss it in the proper form. So, so I, move the, I move the DE3 amendment. Okay, the amendment is uh, before us. Uh, any uh, discussion on the amendment? If you could maybe comment, uh, Representative Liebling, as to what the amendment does. Okay, sure, Mr. Chair. Oh, um, well, the amendment, for, one of the big things the amendment does is it deletes Article 2, which is uh, uh, another kind of, um, somewhat unrelated portion of the bill having to do with assisted living licensure. So that is all gone in after the DE3 amendment. And um, it changes the source or the, the way the funds are handled in the bill. And, and it also adds some reporting requirements and then does some other more minor changes. Okay, the uh, motion is before us. Uh any uh, discussion? Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Liebling, can you restate this is the A3 or A4 amendment? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Garofalo, it's the DE3. Okay, thank you. Okay, any further uh, discussion? Seeing none, then uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Representative Liebling. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. So um, obviously, the one of the biggest issues, the biggest issue right now facing our state is the COVID-19 pandemic and all of the impacts that go along with that. Obviously, we're not the only state or the only country that is dealing with this issue. But as everybody knows, we've taken some steps already to really up our testing for the virus in the state. And this, the bill that is before you is the next step that's really important to follow up on that testing. So it does very little good to just test if we don't follow up with public health measures to control the virus. And uh, this is, I think, the pretty much the, I would say, the most important thing we can do now to um, get this under control and very importantly, to restore confidence. Because even when our, um, the emergency powers goes away, the peacetime emergency is removed, we're still gonna have the virus and we're still going to have the problem of having people have confidence that they can go about their business and not get infected. So this bill, um, appropriates $300 million from the CARES Act funding um, to the Department of Health to carry out these very important tasks. And um, it does, I just want to make it very clear because there's been some concern. This does not change any data privacy laws. 
and it does not require any participation. It doesn't add anything like that. As I said, what it does is it appropriates money from the CARES Act. And um, I do just want to note, I think that it was said on a previous meeting, we don't actually, the legislature doesn't actually have to act to appropriate these funds. But this is the legislature asserting its rightful role in this process by going ahead and appropriating these funds and then um, putting some suggestions into law, I would say, about how we want the, the uh, Commissioner of Health to use them. So the, the bill is purposely very, um, does not have a lot of hard limits in it. It gives a lot of flexibility to the Department of Health because as everybody knows, this pandemic is very fast moving and the conditions change rapidly. Um, suddenly we have an outbreak in Worthington. Um, another, we may, you know, next week there may be another hotspot in another part of the state, another very different kind of setting. So we need to be sure that we leave a lot of flexibility for the Department of Health to act uh, with this money. A couple of things that are in the bill that are not just uh, suggestions to the department. One is there's language in here regarding furloughed employees. Um, it's very clear that the department is going to, or a vendor that it may hire, is going to have to uh, really um, take on a lot of temporary employees. A lot of those really well-prepared people, maybe people who are right now furloughed uh, from other healthcare institutions, nurses, physicians, social workers, other people who may be just the kind of employees that could be hired. And um, we have been hearing that some employers have restricted their employees from taking other kinds of jobs during their furloughs. We wanna make sure that for this purpose, that doesn't happen. So there is language in the bill about that. There's also reporting language, as I mentioned, that was added in this DE because I think one thing that uh, we as legislators do want is to keep close tabs on how the money is being spent so that we can ask the appropriate questions and do the appropriate oversight. So, um, and one other thing I'd like to mention is that we've made an effort in this language, although it's not mandatory, we do really want, hope and expect that there will be a very strong partnership with local public health agencies and local tribal health agencies. And um, there already is, but that's where a lot of this work is happening. That's where people know and understand the communities they're interacting with and know how to reach people and how to help them stay safe or to isolate if that's what they need. So. There is, um, we have uh, suggested strongly that a lot of this funding go to those agencies and that there be a very close partnership throughout. And with that, Mr. Chair, I, I believe that um, Margaret Kelly, who is the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Health, I believe is on the call if, if she has comments um, or with whether the Chair would just like members to ask questions. Um, why don't we uh, go to, uh, we got a couple of members that have questions and uh, uh, then if uh, necessary, we can refer to the department. Uh, Representative Garofalo. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, defer to allowing the author to call on our testifiers first. They may be able to, they may answer their questions and their statements before I would ask them. We can do that. Uh, Representative Liebling, no. Uh, you wanted the uh, department to comment then? I, I assume she was available for questions, but uh, um, Representative Well, Mr. Chair, I, I would leave it up to her if she has, uh, if she needs to correct or add to um, what I've said about the bill. Um, certainly just let me say that um, this was written in partnership with the department, but it is not all the department's bill. So um, there may be things in here that she can't, uh, she doesn't need to be responsible for, certainly, that, that I and, and others helped to write. And I do want to comment, too, that there are in this bill also, we've tried to incorporate what we heard in the Health and Human Services Finance Division as well. So, um, uh, Ms. Kelly, are you, if you're on the call, do you, do you want to comment? Um, Ms. Kelly? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Liebling and others, thank you uh, so yeah, much you for the opportunity. You can yourself for the record as well. My name is Margaret Kelly, Deputy Commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Health. And I think you did a great job, Representative Liebling, describing uh, what we're trying to do with uh, ramping up our case investigation and contact tracing work. And I appreciate uh, your help in putting this forward. And I'm just here to answer questions. Okay, Representative uh, Garofalo. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Representative Liebling, I do have um, a, a lot of questions about this bill, both from a, a understanding the direction of the policy as well as the appropriations. So if we could, again, you briefly covered this, but the appropriations language in <laughs> section two, if you could just explain, um, looks like um, in, the, in that section, we have six separate appropriations. Can you just briefly do a bullet point on each one of those? Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, so actually this is an area, well, let me just first say this was changed in the DE because MMB, we initially had the money flowing through the public health contingency account, but I think uh, MMB wanted to make sure that we didn't commingle the federal and state funds. And so just to clear things up and make it very clear, this is money from the CARES Act that is being appropriated for these particular public health activities. They um, rearrange this section. The particular um, amounts that are suggested underneath here um, kind of came from the Department of Health, but we did adjust the amounts some. So um, I think probably Ms. Kelly would be better to um, at least explain, well, let me give it a try. And then um, if I say anything that's not quite right, she can jump in and correct me. So um, right now, as you probably know, this is, not, this is not new activity. The department is already doing this. Local public health agencies are already doing this to a limited extent. And the department has actually moved a lot of employees within the department over to this activity to be able to ramp up quickly. And um, they just are finding that um, they don't have the capacity. So, um, but they need to continue on the current track for a period of time. So the initial um, under sub one here on line 3.23 of the DE says up to $3 million for short-term staffing. So that's to kind of continue the way they've been doing it. Um, and then let's see, probably the best place to go next to explain this would be to number six, which is on line 4.3, which is the bulk of the money. So the idea is that the department, we need to ramp up our um, tracing capability and our follow-up capability very quickly and very broadly across the state to be able to really have an impact and get our arms around this thing. And by the way, I'm hearing the same thing nationally. Everybody, uh, well, you know, many experts are saying this is what we need to be doing. So Minnesota is going to try to move ahead with this um, as best we can here. Anyway, so this is the bulk of the money, $228 million. And what the department wants to do is either uh, try to hire a vendor to um, really ramp this up quickly. This is like setting up a temporary agency very quickly and then being able to shut it down very quickly. So this is something that our small Department of Health, um, you know, it's, it, it's really not designed for this. And they, they need to do this. They're searching for possible vendors. Um, we've had, by the way, discussion with Senator Benson about this issue and so on. So probably Ms. Kelly will want to talk more about that. But that is what the bulk of this is. And the department has said they may need up to 4,200 people to do this work. So that's a lot of people, a lot of temporary employees to find, to train, to manage, to do this tremendous amount of outwork outreach work that is needed to get this job done. So that's why the bulk of the money is in that pot. Then if we go back to um, line 3.25, we've got money for tribal nations to there. Again, this is the local partners that I spoke about. 
who already do a lot of this work and will continue to do it in particular with offering resources to people who need to be in isolation. Because if you're a person who, um, you know, there may be situations where people don't have a place they can be in isolation. They may, they may need help with alternate housing or they may, may need to help have help finding um, resources like getting food delivered if they don't have someone to help them with that. So these are the kinds of things that local partners will, will need to be doing more of. Um, the same is true on line 3.27. We're talking about local health departments and community health boards who may band together to do this work jointly. Um, 3.31 is the public health information campaign because there is a need to inform the public that um, how this is working, what may be asked of them, the fact that someone may be calling and they should please answer the phone. I know I personally don't answer the phone a lot because you get a lot of scam calls these days and scam calls that may tell you they're from the Department of Health and, and you want you to take some action. So I think it's important that we inform the public about who may be calling and why. Um, line 4.1 talks about information technology. This is, um, there's, uh, this is something Ms. Kelly could probably talk to much better than I could, but um, of course, when you ramp up with this many temporary employees, you need ways for them to log in, to um, keep track of who they've talked to and, um, and be able to also carry out um, just to understand where the virus is. And, um, uh, you know, this, if you're going to do contact tracing, you need to be able to, um, you know, have your data in one place, essentially. And I think that pretty much covers it. Just to note, very importantly, these are really suggested limits. And um, we understand in writing this that the department may come up with very unexpected situations and may need to move money and resources very quickly. So these are not hard limits. And we've simply asked to have reporting if these limits are going to be changed. So we want to, as a legislature, we want to know what's going on. But I think, especially because we're going to be out of session, we're not in a position to micromanage the department, uh, nor do we want to. We don't have the expertise to do that, but we want to be informed. So that's the way this is written, Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Kelly, do you have anything to add? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would just add a little more clarification on the, um, the two vendor contracts that we are uh, looking to enter into. So one is for... Uh, an IT element of this, that we need an interface between our database and the people who are doing the contact tracing, a way for us to upload the cases that need to be called and for the information about the call to be back, downloaded back into our database and a place for all the scripts to be held uh, to kind of direct the, the person doing the calling as to how their work, what, what they should be saying and uh, what they should be asking and what they should be documenting. So that is the IT component that we're looking at and we're speaking with a number of vendors who are standing similar uh, IT solutions up in other states. Uh, that's the, the $30 million and hopefully it will come in much lower than that. Uh, paragraph six, line 4.3, the 228 million is for us to contract with someone who has uh, Representative Liebling mentioned would help us to meet the staffing needs as uh, we ramp up testing and then as uh, we ramp it back down uh, when we come to that. So we would be able to tell a vendor that we need uh, 200 or 300 or 500 additional uh, staff to do the case investigation and contact tracing with us. Um, and so we have made some assumptions uh, around the number of people that we would need based on anywhere from 20 to 30,000 tests happening a day. And that in order to, the whole idea between aggressive, the whole idea with aggressive case management, case investigation and contact tracing 
is to intervene as quickly as possible with an individual who has been tested to communicate with them right away to ensure that they are isolating if they need to and um, so that they're not uh, shedding the virus uh, as they're out in the community. So currently we wait until we get a positive case to do that. And depending on the time of the day that the test is taken and the day of the week that the test is taken and the laboratory that does the test processing, it can take 24 to 48 hours to get the test back all the way up to five to seven days. And so rather than wait for that positive uh, test to come in, especially if it's on the far end of the continuum, for those who are high risk, we would want to reach out to them right away. And so this assumes that we would be uh, contacting 25% of the people who are taking a test, that 25% would be a high risk population. In addition to contacting the positives that result from that high level of testing as well. And so that's why the number here is, is so large that we, on the very high end of 30,000 tests a day for a period of time, we could meet, need as many as 4,200 uh, people to staff this up. Clearly, we would only bring people on as we needed them, and we would make those assessments week by week. Thank you, uh, Representative Grafflo. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, Representative Liebling, you highlighted my, uh, my next question, which was that uh, the appropriations language, it's important that members see the words up to. So it's not really an appropriation amount. It just means that they can spend up to that. And then at the conclusion of the bill, the final paragraph, it just basically says, hey, all that stuff we said about them being to be able to spend up to, they can move the money around too, as long as they just tell us what it is. Um, so I have concerns about the appropriation, but I want to take a step back and have a better understanding of the purpose of this bill. And Representative Liebling, and, and perhaps for um, the individual from the Department of Health, you should know Representative Liebling and I have known each other for a decade and a half. We have a lot of fun in this committee um, going back and forth. But the purposes of my questions with regards to this are truly a better understanding. I do not, un um, so I, I wanna give you that, um, that precursor. Is when I read this bill, when I read this delete all amendment, to me, when I see this, this seems like a dramatic change in state policy that when we started down this epidemic, uh, fighting this epidemic, the focus was on bending the curve, making sure that we uh, staff, you know, that we protect our healthcare system, prevent it from collapsing, and that we build out the infrastructure and capacity. And then once we did that, as we opened up society and a reopened society in a responsible fashion, we would manage the rate of infections that were going out, that we would isolate populations uh, that are vulnerable and can't be allowed to get the virus because they're going to um, be at a high risk of hospitalization or even death, but that for the vast majority of people, um, for the healthy, that for lack of a better word, and please don't miss, take my words out of con to context, but that certain numbers of people over a time frame would get the infection, would build up the immunity, and for the overwhelming majority of that population, they would not require hospitalization um, nor intensive services. And so why I, I'm those are two fundamentally different strategies. Uh, that, that's, that's one strategy. The second strategy is we lock everyone down and try to stop everyone from getting infected, whether they're healthy or not. And to me, when I read this bill, this seems like track two strategy, that this is no, 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 we're not going to let anyone get infected. That's what our, our goal is. And I, I can debate the merits of these, but am I correct in understanding this pivot that this is a different, that we're now pivoting towards stopping everyone from getting infected? Oh, uh, Mr. Liebling or Ms. Kelly, I guess, right. either direction. Mr. Chair, let me just take a stab at it. And Ms. Kelly can tell me if I'm completely off base because, but. Representative Garofalo, I look at this as not locking down, you know, we, we have been in a situation where everybody or many people have been locked down to try to avoid catching the disease. I think it's probably, until we have a vaccine, I think it's unrealistic to think that we can stop everyone from getting it. 
But what this bill is doing, what this approach is doing as I view it, is to um, try to lock down people who have the disease so that the rest of people can feel the confidence to go about their business, um, understanding that, that there will be less um, spread in, in, and less risk to people who are going about their business. Um, I think what we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic that, that I've seen change is that people are afraid you know, even people who aren't in high risk categories, what we're hearing about what this virus does, I mean, first of all, we still don't know what the effects of this thing are. We don't know what the long term effects of it may be. We're starting to hear about some of the effects on children, even some of the ways that this affects people. It isn't just a respiratory disease. We've heard about strokes, we've heard about clots, we've heard about other kinds of, of things that can happen as a result of this disease. So it's very, very important if we're gonna get our economy moving again, to give people some assurance, not 100%, because there's never 100% assurance, but a sense that this is, that if people are, have the disease, that we keep those people out of circulation until they're, not contagious anymore. That's that's what I think the attempt is here. Um, so whether it's, uh, you know, even if our hospitals are up to it, the idea that, you know, even if I'm not, even if I know I'm not gonna die of the disease, even if there's a treatment available, I don't wanna walk out and just go shopping knowing that I could get this terrible disease and be laid up for weeks and weeks unless I have a very strong feeling that, that our state has this under control and that my, my chance of getting infected is, is low in addition to my chance of dying from the disease. So that's my, maybe more my personal response and uh, Deputy Kelly can give us the, the actual Department of Health, probably the real okay. response. So before, before she does that, Mr. Chairman, can I just- um, I'm grateful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Liedling. So um, what you just said there, is I guess that's the point I'm getting at is that, and, and I, I, I would hope that people don't take my comments out of context here, but the focus in my eyes is that if you are in a vulnerable population or you live with someone in a vulnerable population or you're in the healthcare system, if you're part of that sort of, for lack of a better word, protected part of the population, that that's where the focus is, is on protecting those individuals. For everybody else who isn't elderly, who is healthy, um, obviously, if someone's sick, you know, they're, they, they shouldn't be going out in public, whether it's the flu or other things. But I'm trying to understand why, why we would have those people be locked down. I, I don't understand it because when we when we look at the data from other jurisdictions that have done far more testing than us, and it's been and it's been much more extensive. Like I, I bring up the example of. Um, of New York, right? Where they've had, you know, just, it's, it's been basically the worst part of our country in terms of um, death and community spread. Um, you know, one out of five people there have the virus, but the number of deaths that have corresponded to those, to those infections, and again, there's, there's way too many people dying, but that those deaths have been a very, very small percentage of society and they've been primarily concentrated on those at-risk groups and areas. So my understanding was, is that in a measured and reasonable way, we want those non-protected people in a measured way to be getting infected, to build up the immunity so that they are less susceptible for spreading in the future. This is how we avoid a second wave in the fall. And so, there's kind of two questions that represent the leading. Number one, am I understanding it right? <laughs> um, tell me why I'm wrong. You have no problem telling me that in the past. Um, but number two, just isn't this a big change in policy? Isn't this a, a big difference from where we were? Just if you could just elaborate on that, because I I genuinely I'm concerned about this change in direction. But I'd like to hear your opinion on it if I'm misunderstanding it. I, I might interject, Representative Garofalo, just as a reminder, as the lead, I want to give you uh, plenty of latitude, but we do have 
five other people, including four of them from your caucus that uh, do want to be recognized. So Representative Grappel. Well, Representative Liebling, I asked her my question already. Representative Liebling. Well, all right, Mr. Chair and Representative Gruffalo, I don't view this as a change in policy. And I don't know. I mean, this idea that we want everybody to get infected so there's herd immunity. Boy, I don't know. I That's not a policy that I'm aware of. And, mm -hmm. and knowing that we don't know so much about this virus, the idea that we would just say, oh, yeah, everybody get infected so that we'll have heard of, I don't think so. I mean, maybe Ms. Kelly can tell me I'm wrong here, but, you know, as we learn more and more about this virus, um, boy, I, I sure don't feel comfortable with a policy like that. But Ms. Kelly, I'd really like to hear what she has to say. Ms. Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representatives, I think what we're trying to do here is simply find a balance between uh, protecting our most vulnerable, uh, protecting our healthcare workers, uh, opening the economy, uh, allowing people to be social, and uh, ensuring that we don't overrun our healthcare system. And so somewhere in there is a balance that we're trying to reach. And Mr. Chairman, I appreciate I appreciate the guidance you gave me on limiting questions, but um, obviously there's substantial policy in this bill, and it's a rigid, it's it's a delete all amendment in this committee. So we don't. I would prefer that we have these conversations and have these understandings in committee rather than doing this on the House floor. So I I, um, I, I appreciate the limits you want to put around this, but I hope you also understand this is a this is a pretty big deal. So thanks for your indulgence as I. Continue to Mr. Mr. Chair, if I could. I said I wanted to um, give you uh, plenty of latitude, but I did want to remind you that uh, now we're up to about eight or nine people, um, and most of them from uh, your side of the aisle. So I just wanted to make sure that they would have an opportunity for their questions as well. Were you, uh, you. Representative Groffel? I'm um, Representative Liebling wanted to interject before my next question. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to point out that even though it's a DE, that it's not the policy, as Representative Garofalo would put it, is not different than what was heard in the Health and Human Service Finance Committee. It's a DE just because it was uh, there was a lot of tweaks to it, and it just became more convenient to do a DE also that that second article was removed. But this was discussed in committee, so just want to make that clear. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative yes, Liebling. So with regards to um, this conversation we're having about the contact tracing and isolation, I'm having a difficult time understanding that when you have the potential of 10 to 15, 20% of the population infected with this, what the value of contact tracing is outside of protecting vulnerable populations. And it would seem to me that our focus would be on protecting vulnerable populations as opposed to you know building up 30 million of IT and tracking every single person or those are maybe that's perhaps the wrong way to describe it but instead of spending all this money doing that we'd be far better off focusing on protecting vulnerable populations how does contract how does contract tracing work when you have a high percentage of the population that is already an asymptomatic carrier Representative Liebling. Um, Mr. Chair, I think this would be probably one for Deputy Commissioner Kelly. Ms. Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Groffalo, can you repeat your question? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Oh, that's okay. Um, Mr. Chairman and Deputy Commissioner Kelly, uh, in short, how does contact tracing work when you have a substantial portion of the population that is already that are already asymptomatic carriers or um, has already, you know, they've already been infected. If you have a substantial, if you have a large chunk of the population, I thought con contract tracing was more valuable when you're protecting vulnerable populations or when you have those first initial cases. So how does that work? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, the, the value of case investigation and contact tracing is to have the, the, the contact over the phone uh, with somebody who has tested positive or is likely to test positive to, to let them know what the 
what the implications are for them and to talk with them about who they may have been in contact with so that we can encourage them to uh, isolate so that they're not spreading the virus even more and so that they can reach out to or we can assist them to reach out to people they've been in contact with so that uh, when, when someone's asymptomatic and they're spreading the virus, uh, we, we need to be able to be sure that we can break that chain so that as many people who uh, can stay home do so that we're not spreading the virus even more. The idea is to, to not allow people, um, the more people walk around within the community, the more we are gonna spread the virus. And if what we're trying to do is to contain it, then we need to be reaching people who have it and encouraging them to isolate. So Mr. Chairman and Deputy Commissioner sure. Kelly, but if you already have a higher percentage of the population that is infected, how does how it seems like how are you how does that work? I understand like when, when you have an initial outbreak and you have an initial epi, um, beginnings of an epidemic, but we're entering the ninth week of this. So how how does that work when so many people already have it? Ms. Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, I, I don't recall right now where our estimates are in terms of the percentage of the population that are infected, but I don't believe we're at a point yet where a majority of the population is infected. Right, and Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner Kelly, I'm, I'm not implying that a majority of the population has this. I'm simply saying that um, there's a substantial portion of the population that has it and the places and we don't know unless we've done um, antibody testing or full-scale testing which we just haven't done yet but in a place like New York you know over 20 percent of the population has it now I'm not suggesting that Minnesota is at 20 percent but certainly we're at a we're at a level high enough that and we lack the testing infrastructure to be able to know everyone that has it and so Let's, let's just operate, whatever premise we operate off of, don't enough people have this virus already and are asymptomatic carriers that contact tracing doesn't work? Ms. Kelly. So Mr. Chair, Representative, I think I would uh, prefer to have an epidemiologist here helping me to answer these questions, but I think we have a significant portion of the population who is not yet infected. Uh, as those percentages change, our strategies may change. But right now we are trying to find the balance between uh, ensuring that our healthcare system can handle the surge that's coming, ensuring that we protect our most vulnerable. Right now, the majority of the deaths are amongst uh, long-term care residents. Uh, and we're trying to find a way to, to open up the economy as well. Mr. Chairman, I have no um, further questions. Thank you, Deputy uh, uh, Commissioner Kelly. Uh, thank you, Representative Liebling. Um, for the conversation. Just my my final comment on this, and we can go to other questions, obviously. Um, in my eyes, I'm I'm viewing this as a substantial change in policy. That our focus right now should be on maintaining the isolation for vulnerable populations and those who are uh, in the same domicile as vulnerable populations. That's where those resources should be spending. Um, going out and doing contact tracing for the overwhelming majority of the population provides very little value. And the reason being is that upwards of 98, 99% of the healthy populations do not require hospitalization, intensive care unit services. And so my understanding of contact tracing is the value is on the beginning. It's what Seattle did when they first had the, the outbreak occur there, they were able to, to, for lack of a better word, lock it down before it got out, before the genie got out of the bottle. And with a substantial portion of our of Minnesotans, and we can just, we can have a debate about what that percentage is, with a large number of people being asymptomatic carriers for this, I, I don't understand this strategy. I don't understand this change in strategy. And so, Representative Liebling, Liebling, I look forward to talking with you offline, maybe gaining a better understanding or gaining some more knowledge of it. Uh, at this time, I'm not going to be supporting this bill. I look forward to learning more about it, but it seems like this is out of alignment with the previous stated strategy of, of uh, how we're fighting this epidemic. Thank you. 
So thank you, Mr. Okay, Chair. We'll, we'll move forward uh, at this point with others that uh, have questions, but I would like to remind the committee that this was uh, referred to us from HHS uh, Finance uh, Division, so there were meetings there um, as well. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I think there's several things running through my mind here, but uh, just just to tee off of what you just said, that it went to HHS Finance, but it did not go to the Policy Committee. And this is um, a major shift in the policy of the executive branch, in my opinion. Um, my first question um, would be a follow-up to Representative Garofalo's, um, and this probably would go to Deputy Commissioner Kelly. And she mentioned, you know, the asymptomatic people. Well, how does an asymptomatic person know to even get tested? if they have no symptoms. Ms. Kelly. Uh, Madam, Mr. Chair and Representative, uh, asymptomatic people may be tested for a variety of reasons. If there's an outbreak in a long-term care facility uh, and there is one or more residents who are tested, we're recommending that everyone in the facility be tested, including the healthcare workers. And so healthcare workers come and go. They may be asymptomatic. If they're working in a healthcare long-term care facility that has an outbreak, we wanna test them so that we can stop the spread of the virus in that facility. Oftentimes healthcare workers work between multiple facilities. And so if they're asymptomatic and they're going from one facility to another, they will bring the virus with them. So in order to stop the outbreak in more than one facility, we need to test everyone within the facility, including the healthcare workers who may be asymptomatic. Same goes true with any food processing plant or any work, work environment. If there is multiple cases that happen in the work environment, we wanna test everybody so that we can find the asymptomatic people and stop spreading the virus from one uh, environment to another. Mr. Chair, th thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that answer. And I don't know, the way that it was couched um, in your previous comments, it made it sound like just people that are out, you know, wandering around that are carriers and don't know they're carriers, um, that somehow we would be able to test those folks. I certainly understand it in, in um, places where there are hotspots or outbreaks. Um, my next line of questioning, uh, first of all, I want to thank Chair Liebling for at least bringing this issue to the legislature. Um, rather than just having the Minnesota Department of Health set up this massive database. Um, this is the way that things normally should run when the state is going to be starting um, to collect information on Minnesotans. It should be brought through the legislative process and not just um, set up by a, a department or an agency um, that's collecting very sensitive information on Minnesotans. And so I want to thank you for bringing it to the legislature. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, is this a voluntary program for people that um, are test that happen to test positive? Do they have to go through this process of contact tracing, or is that um, is that optional? Ms. Kelly, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, it's optional. I mean, it's voluntary. We're going to reach and, out to people, and if they don't want to share information, that's their prerogative. Representative, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so, where in this bill is that articulated? So, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, as I said at the beginning, Representative Scott, this bill doesn't change anything in current law around that. So that's not in here, but there's no really reason for it to be in here. And let me just take the opportunity to say, first of all, this is, I do not view this as a shift in policy. This is primarily a, um, an appropriations bill. It's appropriating money and frankly, as I think you know, Representative Scott, based on your comment that you just made, we don't even have to do this. <laughs> the, the administration can appropriate this money without us. So this is our opportunity to put our stamp on it, to have discussions about it, and, and maybe to put some parameters around it, which, um, you know, which um, I've attempted to do here. So, um, but there is nothing in this bill about any Change, there's no change in, in policy here. There's certainly no change in any law around consent and sharing of medical information. The Health Records Act is still in force. The uh, department is not doing anything they don't already do. What 
what's really happening here is that it's ramping up the, the volume of it and their ability, the reach of it. But they're already doing contact tracing. The um, local partners are already doing contact tracing. And, um, you know, it's absolutely necessary to do in, when you have a hot spot like, uh, you know, a port plant or whether it's a port plant or a power plant or any other place or a long-term care facility, this is, this is what they do. So um, this is not a change in policy. I just really want to emphasize that. Mr. Chair. Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, this is setting up a, a larger database, especially if you're talking about, you know, 4,200 employees or hiring a third party. Um, I don't know what's happening with the information that's being gathered now on contact tracing, but, um, you know, I have concerns about setting up a gigantic database um, with Minnesotans um, information in it and their whereabouts. And um, how long, um, I guess maybe this question is for the deputy commissioner, how long is this data going to be kept? Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, representative, the COVID-19 is a reportable disease. And so within current law, uh, there are a variety of diseases that are, because they're communicable, are, necess are required to be reported to the Department of Health when they occur. And COVID-19 is one of those reportable diseases. And so anybody who is um, who tests positive for COVID-19, that occurrence is required to be reported to the Department of Health. And so we have a system to record those outbreaks. Um, all of that information has is private data, private healthcare data, and is protected as such. And and. Uh, to the extent it is reviewed or used, it is done so in an anonymized way and in an aggregated way when we report out uh, the incidence of the disease. Mr. Chair? Uh, um, thank you. Um, so I didn't hear an answer in there. Is it, so is it kept forever then? Uh, to Mr. Chair and Representative, I, I don't actually, I don't have the answer to that. I'd have to get back to you. Okay, yeah, I, I would appreciate that. Um, and yep, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, you know, normally when um, there's a large database and, and if this um, COVID uh, event turns out to be uh, as large as some are, protect, are predicting, um, it seems to me that that would be a very large database that would be fairly unique um, within the department. And so, I, I think it should be treated as um, such. I think there should be um, some, some policy surrounding how long the data is kept, um, who has access to the data, um, are audit trails created? Because this can track people where they've been. And some people may not be so willing to let that um, be out there um, just for uh, the government's consumption. So I, I have concerns about this. Um, and I do feel like it is a shift in policy from um, just really targeting uh, those hot spots and those troubled areas uh, to even broader uh, kind of surveillance. So um, I, I have some difficulties with this um, going forward. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Chair Liebling, um, I sit on, uh, as you know, on the in the Health Policy Committee, and we were not privy to the information that seems uh, was offered in your committee. And so, when you provide statements such as, "As we learn more and more about this virus," um, I feel a little bit like I'm in left in the dark for the sake of what was. Uh, privilege to those that sit on uh, Health and Human Services Finance. And so I'm just uh, taken aback a little bit at the, the brevity that uh, this, um, this, this uh, proposal, which clearly in my opinion is a shift in policy, um, has not taken the normative route. I mean, you're, you've already heard 
and, and I would assume that in your caucus, you've taken this up with Chair Lesh, Chair Sundin, Chair Mahoney, Chair Moran, Chair Freiberg, Chair Nelson. And you're shaking your head no, which leads me to believe why wasn't it based upon the provisions and the repercussions for their uh, areas of jurisdiction? Why wasn't there a broader uh, arena to discuss these issues? This is this is clearly a, a, a pivot by the administration to move towards contact tracing um, for for any number of reasons with a huge financial aspect to it. Uh, so the first question is just your response to that, but then also uh, if you or Mr. Marks would like to weigh in on where is the fiscal note on this uh, proposal? Can we, um, <clears throat> I think I'd like to start with Mr. Marks, uh, being that this is a fiscal committee and that should be our main focus, or Mr. Marks. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Albright, there is no fiscal note at this point. Uh, we would assume this is a pretty straightforward appropriation of $300 million. So um, I think the, the the questions as to how the money gets used and so on are, are certainly something that could be addressed in a fiscal note, but uh, we don't have that uh, at this point. The, uh, the cost, uh, the $300 million is pretty straightforward. Okay, Representative Liebling, the other part of the question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Marks. That's exactly what I would have said too. You don't you don't usually fiscal note something when you're just appropriating a set amount of money, um, and that's what this bill is doing. And it's appropriating money that the federal government has given us for this exact purpose. I mean, probably among other related purposes, but this is to combat the virus. So that's the money that we are using for this purpose. I just want to address the issue, the sort of the implication that this hasn't been fully vetted and so on and so on. Um, Representative Albright, when I talk about what I know about the virus, what we're learning about the virus, I read the news. I hear what's, I pay attention to what is going on from the CDC and other places. This isn't some secret information that I have. This is just from being a, an engaged person who pays attention to these issues. This is, so there's no secret here. You also can can know that 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 there's all kinds of unknown stuff about this virus. And if you read accounts of people who've had the virus, it's pretty harrowing. I mean, people even who are healthy. Um, the, the chair of the St. Paul School Board right now is a 31-year-old woman who I read in the paper is fighting for her life from COVID. So anybody who thinks that, oh, I'm just safe because I'm young or I'm I mean, and when people try to say, oh, only people with pre-existing conditions are worry, should worry, a huge number of people have pre-existing conditions and we still don't really understand who's at risk and who isn't. So this is just sort of, I would say, it's not any secret knowledge I've obtained from other chairs or anything like that. It's just, um, you know, this is just what I've learned from paying attention to what's going on. So I just want to put that out there. I do not view this as any kind of change in policy. The bill is an appropriation. And let me just reiterate that we don't even have to do this. If we fail to act, the administration has the money and it has the authority to do most of what is in this bill. It, they won't have to do the reporting. The piece about furloughed employees won't be in there. But, um, you know, this is, we're doing this as, as Representative Scott said, we're doing this so that we can have the discussion and so that we can put an impact on this, on this bill. So I do not think it has to go through any of these other committees. I do not think it has a data provision because it's not doing anything, changing any kind of data rules at all. And I, I do also want to make it very clear because I know that um, I'm assuming that Representative Scott may be concerned about this. Maybe some others are too. There's been some stuff in the news about technology for contact tracing that involves people's phones and location and some apps and stuff like that. That is not contemplated here. I am equally as worried about that kind of technology as anybody who would be in the legislature would be. I am not supportive of doing that. I don't think it's to a point where it's especially helpful, but that kind of tracking, I would really be very, very concerned about. So just wanna 
let you all know that when we talk about building out technology, we're talking about building out the kind of technology we use now just to have it be, there, there needs to be more of it, obviously, if you have that many people feeding in information, but this is not a change in anything that we do now. Okay, we have uh, several people on the list and we allocated roughly an hour for the discussion here, which is rapidly being uh, burned up. And we do have um, one other bill on the agenda. So um, Representative Albright, did you have a follow-up? That was my Mr. request to be, bre to be brief to the uh, people that are on the list. And Mr. I think Chair. we'll stop at Representative Knorr uh, once uh, he gets his question and then we'll um, go to a vote. Uh, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and while I, I typically try to uh, uh, make brevity my friend, I will leave it with um, more of a statement rather than a, a, a prolongation of the questioning that uh, is just manifest by the, the, the presentation of this bill. I mean, you could go to where are the employees going to come from if uh, furloughed employees uh, are not allowed to take out another job. Uh, we were already starting at record low un unemployment before COVID-19. Uh, you're talking about you know, engaging with Minute uh, on a technological platform. Um, I have great concerns about uh, that with regard to just the, the uh, I wish uh, someone from uh, the technology IT perspective could weigh in on that. Uh, you're asking for 20 to 30,000 tests per day. Uh, we haven't even gotten to the difference between testing and contact tracing, which in my viewpoint, is clearly two different uh, perspectives. Um, this all leads back to the earlier point is this is a shift in policy. We are, we are going away from what uh, has, has been the, the concern about uh, you know, limiting the speed of new in infection and the growth of it, protecting the vulnerable. And now all of a sudden, this, this new policy pops up where we're trying to stop everyone from getting the infection. Um, Mr. Chair, this is, uh, if, if, if uh, the testimony is uh, true that the uh, administration could do this without, without us, uh, I, I, I worry uh, maybe less about this bill and more about uh, the concerns uh, that are being undertaken and changing a policy that we all understood before this uh, bill was proposed this morning. Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this conversation has been uh, really most interesting uh, to Representative Garofalo's point and uh, Representative Liebling. Yes, you're correct in that the Department of Health has the ability to do contact tracing now, but this bill and the funding drastically changes the scope of policy because it seeks to help fund contract tracing in a massive uh, type of effort. Contact tracing really is supposed to be used to identify a population uh, that has a communicable disease and to quarantine that population. I can speak to that personally. Back in the 60s, somebody in my family, my grandfather, contracted a highly infectious disease, tuberculosis, which was a big threat at the time. Those who were in immediate contact with him and tested positive, were quarantined to an institution in Walker, Minnesota for months, literally months. The rest of us who were related to the family had to report to MDH on a weekly basis and get a chest x-ray. You can't do that. It's too late. It's already out of the bag. This infection is broad and spread across the general population. This is a waste of time. It won't serve any purpose. Furthermore, in the beginning of this epidemic, pandemic, the governor built a response and a model on the assumption that 850,000 people were gonna be hospitalized and 77,000 were gonna die. Well, let the governor claim credit for having had a success because it hasn't gotten anywhere close to that. So this is, this is really problematic. It is a change of policy. And never before have we 
quarantined healthy people from our society, from our, from our constitutional rights. And I'm getting flooded out here on this side of town, which certainly seems to be well populated with educated people and doctors and physicians who are really, really getting upset with what is continuing to be an evolving and changing policy from trying to bend the curve and be prepared. We've, we've got the ICU beds, we've got the hospital beds, we have the ability to ramp it up. Now we're even talking about purchasing a building for a morgue for which we have 1,100 funeral directors and plenty of crematoriums and or other situations, but I digress. But what is really concerning is that there is in our laws, in federal law, under Title 18, Section 242, prohibits elected officials from usurping the constitutional rights of its citizens under the color of law. And that's what's going on right now. This is a huge change of policy in now trying to protect everybody from getting infected. People are going to have to accept the reality at some point in time that they have to make their own personal decisions, whether it's worth the risk to go into a restaurant or go into a store or whatever. Yes, you pointed out, everybody is afraid. Well, I wonder why. I wonder why. All we've done is fed them with fear. And frankly, you can take the number of cases that we've minimally given our population of five and a half million. We've tested 11, 12, 14,000 people, whatever the number is now that's positive, match that against the death rate. It really doesn't mean anything in terms of data because it doesn't measure all of those that, as has been discussed, are asymptomatic wandering around that we don't know are already positive. And so if you just use the numbers we have, given those who test positive and those who, who clearly uh, have passed away, uh, that death rate is under 5% or around 5%. But if you extrapolate it out to all of those who are unknown to be, which we don't know, I mean, it's likely to be less than 1%. And no percentage is acceptable in terms of, of saying you're not worth uh, any value, but uh, life has to go on. And we just cannot continue to lock down this economy indefinitely, trying to protect somebody from something we don't know about uh, as though we're going to be able to make any difference. In the end, um, it's going to have to take its own path, and we're going to have to wait for either a treatment or a vaccine. And in the meantime, we can't wait 18 months for that. The governor is going to declare another 30-day extension on Wednesday. We all know that. And the constituency is getting restless. This is a change of policy. And we shouldn't be going down this path contract tracing isn't going to serve any purpose, given that it's already, as Garofalo had mentioned, Representative Garofalo mentioned, the genie is out of the bottle. It's too late. There's too many people that have it. It won't serve any purpose. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative North. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and members. Uh, thank you, Chair Liebling. Uh, this is about facts, not fear. It's about science. It's about trusting that we have got people who are doing their job. This is back to basics. It's about multi-pronged approach to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. I think we've had so many people talk about many things. As we increase the testing, it's essential that we get people tested. It's also important that we do robust contact tracing so that we can protect our communities from COVID-19. We're not doing that much about contact tracing. We need more robust system to provide the care for Minnesotans who need it. This is about providing a safe place for those who have contracted COVID-19 so that they can isolate themselves. It's also a, a process of preparing for those who need support by providing them with wraparound services so that they can get the care that they need. We need to look into the science and not the fear that many people have talked about. Uh, people need a uh, more culturally appropriate, uh, linguistically appropriate service in order to ensure that we protect Minnesotans from all corners. When we see the spread going into communities, mostly in communities of color, who are struggling, uh, we need to be able to find out what can we do to protect Minnesotans. They live in our communities. They live in rural Minnesota. They live in greater Minnesota. They live in urban settings. 
uh, we need to be able to provide the care that people need. Uh, you should look at the numbers. Uh, we've lost a lot of Minnesotans. Many people are contracting COVID-19. It's about leadership. And I think we need to be supporting the science and not the fear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Uh, Representative Liebling, would you care to renew your motion? And then we'll go to a vote. Uh, as I indicated, Representative Nora was going to be the last uh, person to comment. All right, and thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to, just as a really quick closing comment, I just want to say that, um, you know, in this pandemic, a lot of people seem to think that they have credentials to be an epidemiologist and to, uh, and to talk to the science. I really appreciate Representative Nora's comment. I actually have a, a master's degree in epidemiology from a number of years ago, and I do not consider myself qualified to tell the Department of Health the way in which they should uh, conduct the deal with the pandemic, but apparently a lot of a lot of people do. So, uh, Mr. Chair, with that, I would like to renew my motion that House File 4579, the first engrossment as amended, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, the motion is before us. Any further discussion? Seeing none, then uh, the clerk will take the roll. Representative Carlson? Aye. Carlson, aye. Representative Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo? No. Garofalo, no. Representative Albright? No. Albright, no. Representative Bernardi? Representative Bernardi? Aye. Bernardi votes aye. Representative Davids? No. Davids, no. Representative Davney? Davney votes aye. Davney, aye. Representative Dreskowski? Representative Dreskowski? Representative Eklund? Aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hamilton? No. Hamilton, no. Representative Hansen? Hansen, aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hausman? Aye. Hausman, aye. Representative Hertos? No. Hertos, no. Representative Hornstein? Aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Cresha? Cresha, no. Cresha, no. Representative Liebling? Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly? Lilly, aye. Lilly, aye. Oh, Representative Long? Aye. Long, aye. Representative Mariani? Yes. Mariani, aye. Representative Marquart? Aye. Marquart, aye. Representative Nelson? Aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor? Yes. Noor, aye. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Pulowski, aye. Representative Poppy? Aye. Poppy, aye. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Representative Scott? No. Nope. Scott, no. Representative Torkelson? No. Torkelson, no. Representative Vogel? No. Vogel, no. Representative Wigenius? Representative Wigenius? Yes. Wigenius, aye. Representative Dreskowski? No. Driskowski, no. Has everyone uh, voted um, that wishes to vote? I think we've got everybody. 18 ayes, 11 nays. The motion uh, carried and uh, House File um, 4579 will be, has passed and will be placed on the general orders. With that, uh, we'll go to the uh, next bill on the agenda, which is uh, House File 4374, Representative uh, Pinto. Uh, would uh, Representative Olson uh, make a motion, please? 
Mr. Chair, I move that House File 4374, the first engrossment, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, Representative Olson, would you care to move the amendment? Mr. Chair, I'll also move the A4 amendment on behalf of the author. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us. Uh, Representative Pinto, would you uh, care to comment on the amendment? On the amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, members. Uh, the amendment uh, uh, pulls into the bill some language, just um, updates it with some language that um, had passed through committee and, and other bills. Um, it uh, adjusts the uh, maximum registration fee that may be paid um, uh, for child care assistance uh, to be in compliance with, uh, with federal law, um, consistent with the underlying bill. And, um, uh, and it also adjusts the um, the uh, implementation deadline uh, to make it work for the uh, for the department, um, and so these are some requests made by the department to make the uh, underlying bill work. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any discussion on the amendment? <clears throat> uh, seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Uh, Representative uh, Pinto on the uh, bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, so members, um, uh, just a little bit of background. Our state's uh, child care assistance program uh, sets rates for providers uh, uh, in payment. And, and this is a critical program for low-income families throughout our state and every one of our districts. Sets those rates based on a survey that is taken every three years of provider rates. Um, the current uh, rates are set uh, at the 25th percentile. So you go down 75 places on the survey, so a relatively low rate and a survey taken in 2011. The federal government has a requirement that the rates be set at the 25th percentile of the current survey, which makes sense. It should be the current rates. Um, that's quite a low standard. Most states are far above it. Our state is below even that standard. What House File 4374 uh, would do is simply increase the rates to meet uh, that federal standard to have providers um, be paid uh, uh, slightly better than the, um, than the extremely low amount they're receiving right now. Um, uh, I should note that there is no um, state cost to this, um, uh, at least in the next couple of years, and actually there shouldn't be uh, even in the tails. Um, it's entirely paid for with federal funds that we, in fact, already have specifically for this purpose. There's $65 million sitting in a bank account that cannot be used for anything else except for this. So we simply need uh, authorization to have our providers be paid uh, a slightly higher amount uh, and if we don't do this, there is a five and a half million dollar federal penalty. So we actually go backwards by five and a half million dollars. And of course, we also go backwards for uh, the parents who need care, the employers who need their uh, employees to have care for communities, and of course, for the little kids who um, who uh, are being taken care of uh, to get off to a good start. So there's every reason to do this. I will note that the bill also does contain one small provision to also allow military child care providers to receive CCAP funding. We have some military families who right now are inconvenience having to go to a different provider. It'd be good if the military provider um, uh, in their community is able to receive uh, this uh, this funding to be able to provide convenient care for the families. So with, uh, with that, certainly open for your questions. Okay, uh, Representative Grafel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Representative Pinto, in the fiscal note, there's a dramatically different cost in one fiscal year versus another. Can you just explain why that is? So Represent Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Garofalo. So um, the funding for the first few years is paid for, uh, the cost for the first few years is paid for with federal funds, um, much of which we already have on hand. Um, in that final year, what that reflects is that the federal funds um, are, in theory, no longer available. And so in that final year, we're paying using state dollars. I should note, though, that if the federal funding continues as it has for every year since the creation of this program several decades ago, um, simply stays steady, then in fact, um, federal funds will also cover uh, the cost in that last year. But we worked with MMB and because of the, their accounting rules, they're not able to take into account because of course the federal funds have not actually been allocated for several years from now. So that's the reason for the jump is uh, the we move from federal funding to state funding in theory in that final year. Um, Mr. Chairman, Representative, so, so when I'm looking at our the fiscal tracking spreadsheet, um, the cumulative cost from all sources, which line would reflect that? Yes. Representative Pinto. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I might actually ask, I'm not sure if, if Mr. Berg from HHS, uh, from our, our nonpartisan staff is um, is available. I may be able to answer my answer myself. Oh. I'm bringing it up, but if he is, then I might ask. I do have him on my list of available people. Uh, Mr. Berg? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Garofalo. So on the tracking sheet that I hope you're looking at, the child care rate proposal funding, uh, for uh, which uh, just below the title says, uh, in including May budget re-estimate. The line on the for the first two years, fiscal years 21 and fiscal years 22, the bottom line of federal revenue reflects the total expenditure. So 20.4 million in fiscal year 21 and uh, 45.9 million in fiscal 22. In 23, we do not have quite enough money, federal money in hand. So you see in the bottom line that we are spending 39.9 million of federal funds. And then on the top line that we are estimated in that year, if nothing changes, if we don't get more federal funds, uh, we're estimated to spend 19.2 million in state money in the last year of the planning horizon. Okay, so, um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Berg, so um, what 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 lines would I add together to get the cumulative total then? Like, so if I if I was looking for a, a sum total line here, imagine a imaginary line ten. What lines would I combine together to get to that total? Uh, Mr. Berg, Mr. Chair, Representative Garofalo, in fiscal years twenty one and twenty two, it would be line nine. That's the sum total. And in fiscal year 23, it would be line nine plus line one. Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Berg. Any further uh, discussion? Representative Olson, would you care to renew the motion? Yes, Mr. Chair. I renew my motion that House File 4374, the first engrossment as amended, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Sparkman, would you uh, take the roll? Representative Carlson? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Representative Olson? Aye. Olson? Aye. Representative Garofalo? No. Garofalo? No. Representative Albright? No. Albright? No. Representative Bernardi? Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Davids? No. Davids, no. Representative Davney? Aye. Davney, aye. Representative Dreskowski? No. Dreskowski, no. Representative Eklund? Aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hamilton? No. Hamilton, no. Representative Hansen? Aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hausman? Aye. Hausman, aye. Representative Hertos? No. Hertos, no. Representative Hornstein? Aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Cresha? Cresha, no. Cresha, no. Representative Liebling? Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly? Aye. Lilly, aye. Representative Long? Aye. Long, aye. Representative Mariani? Aye. Mariani, aye. Representative Marquart? Aye. Marquart, aye. Representative Nelson? Aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor? Aye. Noor, aye. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Pulowski, aye. Representative Poppy? Aye. Poppy, aye. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Representative Scott? No. Scott, no. Representative Torkelson? No. Torkelson, no. Representative Vogel? No. Vogel, no. Representative Wikinius? Yes. Eugenius, aye. 18 ayes, 11 nays.
Okay, the uh, motion uh, carried and uh, House File 4374 will be placed on the general orders. And uh, with that, uh, that concludes our uh, business for the day. Uh, we'll be um, back together tomorrow. So with that, we are adjourned.